But a good piezoelectric crystal, let's say, is quartz. Been known for a long time. A piezoelectric crystal is a crystal, always a, a highly anisotropic crystal, but it's one which, if you squeeze, it will generate an electric current. Or if you provide an electric current across the crystal, it will change its shape. And that says that if we have a piece of quartz of the proper cut and the proper thickness, the proper orientation, the proper thickness, and we put a mechanical, uh, excuse me, an electrical impulse on this, just uh, a DC potential on it, it may contract. If we take the potential off, it would relax and go back. Or if we res re reversed the current in the material, it would go back. And so if we put, let's say, a 60 cycle current on this piece of quartz, it will mechanically go back and forth at 60 cycles. And so, therefore, we have a frequency generator, a mechanically, mechanical frequency generator that will push the air around, compress it, make audible sound, and we could hear this. Well, if the frequency is too high, we won't hear it. And so we generally have ultrasonics, but this is a method that we use. And we use such devices as these piezoelectric crystals as frequency generators and all of our radio work and all of the control work where we need to know exact frequencies of something. But now if I have such a little piezoelectric crystal, I could put it on the surface of a piece of metal, if I could couple it with a piece of metal, and I could do this by putting an oil film or something, that, just a water even, just to make sure I have a media through which I can transfer the motion, right? Not the electrical impulse now, but the mechanical motion. So it's the same thing as saying, I'm going to hit the end of the bar with something. I hit it with a little wave, a, a moving wave, a particle wave and I get traveling in this piece of metal uh, a sound wave that runs down to one end of the bar. Now, I told you before in this series that, hey, this becomes important. An old the gentleman named Young, way back when, uh, a long time ago, told us exactly how fast this wave is going to move. It's going to be equal to the square root of the modulus of elasticity of the material divided by the mass density of the material. So we know how fast it's going to move in the material if we know its modulus of elasticity. And the wave is going to run all the way to the end of the bar. When it gets to the end of the bar, it's going to push the bar out, but it's elastically loaded, and there's nothing else for it to push on other than the air, so it's going to relax, and it's going to come back, and you have a wave traveling back down the bar again. And then it's going to go back until it hits the transducer. And then that mechanical wave is going to squeeze the, transdu the transducer and make an electrical impulse. So with one transducer, we can, for instance, find out exactly how long the bar is if we know the modulus of elasticity. Or if we don't know the modulus of elasticity, and we know exactly how long the bar is, we can determine the modulus, and we know the density, we can determine the modulus of elasticity. Or, if we have a crack in the middle of the bar, we can excite the wave, the wave will run down to the crack, unload itself, and reflect back from the crack for that little teeny volume of the crack. The rest of the wave travel around it and go to the end of the bar and come back. And on the oscilloscope, we can watch the time required from the initial pulse to the pulse that came from the far end. And we can recognize that. We know how long the bar is. And let's say one third of the way, we find a little pip in, on the oscilloscope. And we say, gee, that's coming from a, a fracture that's in the middle and we know exactly where the fracture is, and would we see it now if it's oriented slightly differently? The answer is, well, we wouldn't see it as well, but we would see it. Actually, the, the volume of the energy, the, the amount of the energy that would come back to us would become decreasing and decreasing because the interface becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's gonna be a crack size that will be a minimum crack size below which we will not be able to get an acoustical picture. <clears throat> well, we can do this now and find the cracks in the material. And that we're going to get an index. And we certainly didn't destroy the material. This is certainly a non-destructive method of testing. We can do something else. That is to say, we could take a piece of material. We could even take a structure and say, I'm interested in finding out now what's going to happen if I load this material up because proof stressing is a good method of non-destructive evaluation. Let's suppose I am making a bar to hold a big weight, 
just a, a, a connection between something that's going to support the weight and the weight itself. And I want to make that bar as small as possible. And I design it and I say, it will only elastically deform if I ha hang the weight on it. But it will be just below the elastic limit. Will it work? Well, a good thing to do is, before you put it in service, is to put a weight that size on it and pick it up and see if it really held it, right? And if it held it, and that's going to be the limit condition in your service, then you say, I have proof stressed it. It will go at least this high. You know that. And you feel pretty confident about putting it in the service. And you do put it in service, so it's non-destructive. If you do that, and you put a transducer on it, and you got it near its elastic limit, what would happen is you'd hear a noise. You'd have acoustic emission. And we can count the number of emissions and find out that we can assign to those numbers this particular little value that we call C before in the plots. That will be the acceptance of those particular noises, the number of those noises that we will hear to say, hey, this piece is no good. It doesn't fit. And this is proof stressing, and this is acoustic emission method, and we do that in examining a lot of things like boilers that are already in service. The boiler is in service, and you want to know is it is in good condition today as it was a year ago. A year ago, we went in and put a hydraulic pressure inside the boiler and listened to it with our little transducer, and we got a certain level of the acoustic emission. Today we go back and we raise it to the same level hydraulically, listen to it again. If the acoustic level is higher, we're getting damage in the part. So it's, it's a way of getting this little index that we need to get. Well, I've covered uh, a number of these things in, in the acoustic range, but we believe at my school that the best way of all of looking at the damage in the material is something called the acoustic attenuation. If you had a bar of material and it were being loaded back and forth, say in a fatigue test, and you put a wave in it and it went all the way to the end of the bar and came back, you'd find that the height of the wave would not be as high on the second pass as it was on the first pass. It wouldn't be as high on the third pass as it was on the second pass. And we call this attenuation. The energy is being taken out of the material by internal friction of the, ma of the material itself. The energy is being taken out of the wave by the internal friction of the material itself. And so you could plot the maximum amplitude as a function of the number of reflections, and you'd find that you'd have a logarithmic, logarithmic decrement. And that exponent is called the attenuation. If we look at that as a function of the number of cycles that we have in a fatigue specimen, we found out at our university something that, that is so exciting that, that, again, I wish I could live a long, long time to see it develop so we can look at everything this way. Here's what we found out. If you take a, a fatigue bar and you fatigue it till it fractures, and if the fracture life is way off here somewhere, and you say it took, let's say it took 60,000 cycles, Right, 60 million cycles to fracture it, way off here somewhere. You keep looking at this with acoustic crystal to find out when the first crack would occur. You would find that the first crack would occur about 95% of the life of the piece. Hey, that's not too good a news, is it? That says if you're going to run that airplane into an inspection station every six months and you're going to listen to it, when they finally hear that difficulty, like listening to the doctor listens to your heart and he says, you've developed a heart problem, you've got a murmur, right? And the guy listens to the airplane part, the critical member in the airplane, he says, uh-oh, uh, I, I know. He's looked at the, the uh, image and he finds a little crack in there. And he says, you got a crack. You better take this thing out of service, right? If the crack is big enough, if it fits the, the quality control uh, curves. He says, you better take this out of service. And that crack might not be big enough, and you may say it's still all right. right? But, but nevertheless, it's at about 95% of the life of the airplane. You don't want to know how long you're going to live. I don't think. I don't want to know how long I'm going to live. I mean, you don't want to know if you're going to die tomorrow or two years from tomorrow exactly, right? That's really bad news. But if I'm going to fly in an airplane, I'd surely like to know that it's going to get to where I want to go to, that I get onto the terra firma before anything fails, right? So I want to make sure that I know that I'm only 60% of the life of this part. And we found at Hopkins that, gee whiz, if we look at the attenuation at 60% of the life of the piece, 
we get a change in the attenuation by about four decibels, and we can pick that up when we say, we have 60% of the life of the piece. Now, I think that's exciting, but we can only do that with specimens that are the shape that allow us to put the transducer on it and do this in a laboratory test. But won't it be exciting when we can do it for all complicated parts like T-rails and channel beams and whatnot that we have in critical structures like bridges and airplanes and whatnot. In electrical impedance or eddy current testing, discontinuities in the material show up as changes in the test piece's impedance. Acoustic emission or ultrasonic inspection relies on listening to echoes from a piezoelectric crystal to locate defects in a test piece. Proof stressing compares acoustic emission to other qualified test results. Acoustic attenuation is emerging as a technique that may someday enable predicting how close parts in service have come to achieving their potential life. Well, I, I've covered, I think, just about all of these particular methods that we use today. I guess the next thing I need to tell you is uh, we've got real problem in the field now. You, I'm sure you read the newspapers and you know that about 50% of all the bridges in this country are in bad shape. Uh, they, they're about to fall down or we've got problems. And not only that, we read every now and then where one does fall down. And so we know this is no, no, no joke. And we have this problem of now inspecting all of these things transportation devices, particularly airplanes, bridges, pipelines, transmission lines, automobile parts, anything that has to do with transmission, uh, anything that, that's going to give us a velocity aspect that will kill people or maim people. And we need to examine them by non-destructive evaluation and say, hey, this bridge is in worse shape than that bridge. Take this cast iron pipe out of the ground first because this is where you're going to get the leaks. Right? We've got to know what to do first because we can't do everything at once either from the standpoint of manpower or economically. So we need to be able to go out and do something. Now we get part of the information that we need from doing uh, fracture, or foot, excuse me, failure analysis. And uh, I've done a bit of this in my life, although uh, I, I don't really claim to be a failure analysis expert, but forensic metallurgy has always been fascinating to me. By the way, this word forensic just comes from the word forum, and it means to argue. And so anything that has to do with law is a forensic study. So you can have forensic engineering, forensic metallurgy, uh, uh, patent, patents, pursuit of patents, let's say, uh, in metals is forensic metallurgy because it has to do with law. But <coughs> you can generally wind up in court uh, when you do this. You're lesson booklet does an excellent job of telling you how you should proceed in a failure analysis. Now what generally happens in a failure analysis that's damaging is someone who does not know what you should do in failure analysis destroys the evidence before the person that does know can get there and rescue it and handle it properly. It's also possible that someone can go and rescue the piece and still not know what to do with it and damage it before anyone can find it what really should be done with it. Now I would like, if I have the time, to recite a few things that go on in this area. <coughs>